Good morning, everybody. Uh, this is Juan Barraza with the Center for Entrepreneurship at Portland State University. I'm the Director of uh, Student Innovation, and thank you for joining us today uh, in our first webinar of, the, of a series of uh, webinars we have designed in collaboration with JAMA Software to help you get started with your projects in preparation for the uh, competition. Uh, today, our topic is user research for innovators. Uh, we will be talking uh, with Eva Miller. Uh, she's the user experience manager for Yama Software. And Inventor is possible thanks to the support from the Lamont Foundation, Portland State University, and Yama Software. Um, with that said, I'm going to hand it over to Eva. Uh, welcome, Eva. Thank you for uh, joining us and making time out of your busy schedule to talk about the importance of user experience. All right. Well, thanks for inviting me. Um, hello to everyone who's uh, on the line listening right now. Um, I'm Eva Miller. I'm the manager of user experience here at JAMA Software. And a little about me, if you didn't read my bio, I lead a team of four user experience professionals here at JAMA. And um, I've worked at JAMA for about five years. And before that, I led product research and design for clients and um, other employers like Cisco Systems, Intel, Nike, Stanford University, and WebMD Health Services. Uh, I also have a master's degree in information science, and I've worked in public libraries in Oregon where I launched award-winning statewide and national digital initiatives for shared library services. Um, and more recently, I spent a year as a design impact fellow in Bangalore, India, finding better ways to scale a life skills program that helps underserved youth launch a career path. And I say all that just to let you know, there are many ways to apply design thinking in your career and many paths to becoming a product maker. Okay. Um, so here's what we're going to cover today on our topic, understanding people and problems, user research to make the right product. The topics today are, what is user experience? I do find people are sometimes not clear on what that is. Um, user research methods. Generally, there are things that are more qualitative or fuzzy and more quantitative and, and you can count them. Uh, there are lots of user research methods. So. I'm going to have to be humble about what I can impart to you today about any one of them. Um, we're going to focus on three of them, as I mentioned here, field studies, interviews, and surveys. But to be, um, to be blunt, you could spend a whole day just trying to figure out how to do a good field study. Um, there are courses like that. So um, we're going to give you a taste and give you plenty of ways that you can um, proceed from there. Uh, and then analyzing research, you've done all this work, and then what do you do with it? And like I said, I promise to give you some resources so you can learn more and, um, and do some good user research on your own. Okay, so uh, the first topic, what is user experience? Um, well, many people think it's about how things look and feel, but that's really just a small part of what we do. Um, UI is not UX, and these things often get confused. Creating an experience for someone requires a lot of different skills and ways of looking at things. So this is the UX unicorn, um, and you'll see user research there at the head of the unicorn. That's just one thing. Um, there are many different aspects to this. It's not likely that one person can do all of these things. So how does user experience, all of these things that you see on our or you have unicorn. How does it help product teams make the journey from idea to experience? Well, most products benefit from having UX expertise, like you see scattered across your unicorn, that um, takes you from fuzzy questions or possibilities to clear designs and well-crafted products based in evidence. So in doing that, you would most likely need most of the skills shown here though it's not likely, as I said, that one person can do all of these things. To make human-centered design decisions, it's important to start, though, from user research and then narrow down your approach based on what you learn. To make successful products that people need and love, you must be able to imagine, what's it like to be those people? What problems or needs do they have that you can meet through a product idea? So another way to think about it, and this is, a very old idea in design is that 
you're seeking constraints in making a good product. The best designers that you'll meet are actually not happy to please themselves and do whatever they want. That doesn't make them very happy. They, they, they actually want sound reasons to say no to many possibilities. And user research, while it, it unlocks a lot of possibilities, but it also introduces constraints and it indicates paths that actually solve the problem that you're trying to figure out or, or meet the opportunity um, sustainably and well. And you'll see here on our <clears throat> unicorn usability, and some people think user research is usability, and they confuse the two things. Usability is a kind of user research, but in this presentation, we're not gonna dwell a lot on usability testing. It is an important research activity um, for improving existing products or, or checking a prototype by observing whether people can do simple tasks or understand the design choices you already made. But by that point, it's a little bit late. For a brand new effort that has a high risk of failure, and frankly, most brand new efforts have a high risk of failure, you can reduce uncertainty and unknowns by first getting inside the heads and the world of the people you want to serve with your product. And there's an art to user research. It's not, it's not all science, it's art and science. Um, because people really can't tell you what to make. You shouldn't ask them. <laughs> they, can't, they can't help you with that. It's your job to interpret what you discover. There are many ways to engage with them early in your product strat st um, strategy process. Um, and that way you can improve your ability to empathize with them. You can imagine what they would like or want. And your user research will help your whole product team look at your problem or opportunity through the eyes of the people you wanna reach. So if you do this, you will raise the likelihood that what you make will be desirable and successful. So how does the user experience work, all of this, fit into the larger product process? Well, <clears throat> you might have seen this before if you took um, a, a design thinking, you might have had a design thinking training earlier, I think I heard that. So you might have seen these circles, um, and these show you how user experience, especially user research, fits into everything else that you have to do to make a good product. Um, IDEO uh, is a product design company and consultancy, and they've greatly popularized design thinking and human-centered design methods. And so many companies now embrace those. And this, the, this, the picture you're looking at, this is IDEO's time-tested three-circle model of how innovative products get made. So what I'm gonna do is walk you through an example that comes from my past. It's not at JAMA, it was at a past employer but, um, and show you how this works. So often a product idea is going to start with viability, this circle here. <clears throat> and what viability means is, is this valuable to do? Um, there's a business need or belief that the marketplace wants something that you can or should provide. It's maybe it'll be profitable for you. There's value there. But if you stop there, it's risky. For example, and here's again, an example from my career. There, you may have market research that shows um, people with diabetes cost their employers a lot of money in healthcare costs. So if you can make people with diabetes healthier, you will then save money for employers. And then you could sell that product, whatever it is, to those employers who would provide it to their employees. So to be purely viable, you might do what a product development company often does. You just jump to a solution too fast. Let's say you decide, let's find a way to make diabetic employees track and do everything they're supposed to track and do, and then of course they'll be healthier. Employers will buy that product and then you'll offer it, they'll offer it to their employees, as I said, to save money, but you have some doubts. Uh, the business has some doubts because there's probably already a lot of tracking and wellness programs out there for employers to use. Maybe it would be hard to get customers Competitive analysis like that is market research though, not user research. It's important not to confuse them. Although it's, it is helpful to understand what's out there already. You don't wanna just copy the rest, you wanna offer something different and better. So next, you might wonder if you can even make a tracker like that. Something that helps a person remember and track everything about their condition so they manage it better and save employers money is it feasible? Are we able to make this? And you discover that it's probably not too hard to create a health portfolio for diabetics that tracks, reports, reminds them 
Plus, you can actually get personal health information through insurance data, and you can tap into wireless blood sugar monitors. So your product could actually technically know for sure whether people go to the doctor are testing enough, um, if they have good blood values over time, if those improve. And so by this time, you might be convinced more than ever about your idea. I would say there's one big problem with all of this though. You do not actually know anything about the people who will use your product. So, desirability. And this is the, this is the job of user experience designers and especially of user research. What if you had started with what people want or need and with what they do or think or feel? What if you had spent some time learning what people want and need as they manage diabetes? So if you did that, and I did do this, this is work I've done, um, you would discover that type one and type two diabetics think and behave differently towards their condition. You would see that even if you just focus on type two diabetics who gradually develop diabetes but aren't born with it, people are still not all the same. They're in different stages of readiness. So some of them are not ready to accept their diabetes and they wouldn't use your product. Some are new to diabetes and they're pretty frightened and they're very motivated to get better. They have tons of information and medical guidance and they're working really hard on their self-care. Yes, they would use your product, but they probably don't need it. Employers wouldn't gain much from helping people who are already doing so well. But some diabetics have lived with the condition for a while and they've gotten a little tired of all of the extra self-care tasks you have to do. <clears throat> they get depressed or demotivated because it, it occurs to them over time, diabetes is not getting better, it's not going away. So they start cutting corners or maybe not being as good about managing their condition. They don't backslide on everything though, just a few things. And it's, it's unique for each person, the, the little event that they miss or the little task they don't do. And eventually they need a little help or new inspiration to get back on track. Now these are the people who would both benefit from your idea and may cost their employers money as they take their eye off staying healthy. So you also learn there are diabetics who become very zen about their condition. So they're very good at this and they know how to stay in the moment. They glance ahead to the next thing they need to do, then they let it go and enjoy their meal or snack or their walk and they stay calmly focused on where they're at in their day. So now you realize you may need to forget about your earlier ideas to track and manage everything. You want your backslider diabetic to learn the Zen master way of recognizing and correcting a problem early without stressing about it. And that just means being mindful about one or two things during the day or week that keep falling through the cracks, not everything, because that's too overwhelming for someone with a medical condition that's kind of already getting them down. So they don't need lots of information and nagging. They already know what to do. They just need help rebuilding good habits. And it occurs to you that this is something many people need and want, making a good habit, building a good habit. Um, so maybe it would be better to make a product that helps people identify and form a healthy habit. Taking tiny steps and building up over time, learning to be more mindful and kind to yourself. And actually the company ended up, they did build that product to, make, to build a healthy habit based on the research we did. So you can see how it changes from, we could do this, we could make money on it, it's technically possible, but wait a minute, that's not really what people want. That's not really what would help them, okay? Another way to think about it, um, this is called the double diamond design process, and it shows how user experience and research fit into product teams. Um, this, this idea came from the British Design Council, so you can see that thinking diverges and converges in this model. And this means there's times in a product um, design process or a product creation process where you are going to gather more information and pursue many ideas and directions. That's divergent thinking. You're looking at all the possibilities, but these are followed by times when you analyze what you've learned and select a specific way forward. That's convergent thinking. You say no to less fruitful paths and you follow the one that balances business, technical, and user concerns. So you'll see like where the diamonds meet, there's a very big decision point. And that's the point where you actually have a well-defined problem and you understand people.
pretty well who are affected by that problem. And you have to decide, or maybe you have a, a variety of ways you could go, but at that point you're deciding which well-defined problem you're going to build. And user research can help you the most in this part of the process, design the right thing. Um, and that prevents costly mistakes and make sure you have that well-defined problem to solve for the right people. Um, I will say as a designer, you're often faced, the situation I described with the diabetes management product, and you're often faced with product requests that don't have well understood or defined problems to solve. Um, but through user research, you can help drive the team towards understanding people and defining problems well enough to create the right product or feature. So as in that example of helping employers save money by making people with diabetes healthier, um, this may mean a solution just arises too early or the audience for the product is not specific or clear. Products are always on a timeline. There's a lot of pressure to deliver them fast, but I just, I guarantee you spending more time up front on learning what you need to know to design the right thing usually pays off later by preventing rework late in the process or frankly making products that no one really wants. Okay, so how do you do this? <laughs> Now that you know why it's important, how it all fits, um, how do you do it? What are some good methods? Well, unfortunately, I have to tell you there's not a quick answer to what's a good method. It kind of all depends. Um, it depends on how much you already know about the problem you're trying to solve and what kind of questions you need to answer. So um, this grid, this confusing looking grid, uh, is based on a long-standing model created by a person named Christian Rohrer. He calls this a landscape of user research methods. His model actually has a lot more um, items on it than I have put here. But when I first found his grid, it really helped me understand much better how to use various methods. And then I just had to hit the books and learn how to use each one. So what's going on here is you'll see, um, you'll see one scale is from qualitative to quantitative and that means more about emotions and words and situations and and things that are fuzzier and require um deeper analysis you have you get richer insight i think from qualitative you're understanding why um, the quantitative side of the scale is more things that you can count um, it's there are more more i think uh, more data and strong patterns but it's not telling you why, it's kind of telling you what's going on. So you'll see things like um, usage data. So as people are clicking around or using products, it's collecting data, you can see what they're doing. You don't always know why they're doing that. So the qualitative and quantitative spectrum is important to understand. When do you need a richer understanding to try to find insight? When do you just need to verify a hunch or look for a, a clue that will lead you to go and ask why this is happening? So for students that they have a challenge, build a prototype in 90 days, mm -hmm. it will be more conducive for them to do a qualitative uh, user research? A little more, yeah. A little no. more qualitative, I okay. think. There may be, they may get to a point where they have specific things that they're trying to figure out and they could actually do a survey on those specific things. But um, I would say if you're doing something brand new and you don't know very much about who might use it and how it should work, you have kind of a rough direction you're going. More qualitative stuff is going to be more helpful to you, I think. Okay. Uh, so Sandeep has a question. Uh, Sandeep, uh, I'm going to unmute you and then we can. Hold on a second. Give us a second. What is your question? Hi, Sa can you hear Sandeep? me? Can you hear me? See, so we can hear you. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Sandeep? Hi, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Oh, hi. Um, I had a question on qualitative, uh, the research. Um, how effective do you find, um, because if sometimes people aren't here in the uh, Portland area, say, uh, how effective do you find, uh, what strategies would you use for phone calling interviews and all that? I'll get into that a little bit later. I'll talk about that um, in a fair amount of detail. Okay, thank you. Sorry about that. But no, it's okay. But it's, it's, it is, um, 
sort of impressive how much you can get from even a teleconference or phone call interview situation if you choose the right people to talk to and if you have a really good interview guide written. Perfect. No, that, 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 that's good. So I think one of the one of the things that we we challenge we face all the time with the students is how, how to figure out how to they have little little time mm -hmm. to build their prototype and mm -hmm. but allow kind of enough uh, enough of that time up front right. to be able to talk to people that will use it versus building in a vacuum. Right, yeah. right, right. So as I said, these are common methods. There are there are many more. Um, the other end of the scale is what people do versus what they think or say. Sometimes this is called um, behavioral versus attitudinal. If you actually look at what people do, that tells you a lot, um, but sometimes you're not sure what's behind it. If you focus too much on just what people think or say, people aren't always the most reliable reporters <laughs> of, their own, um, of their own behavior. They maybe think they're doing better than they are. But um, as I said, I've only put common methods in here. There are books filled with information about all these methods. So I don't wanna, I wanna frighten you, but like, this is a very rich area of practice. Um, in fact, uh, there's a sort of encyclopedia that Bella Martin and Bruce Hannington wrote called Universal Methods of Design, 100 Ways to Research Complex Problems. So um, there's really no, no end of methods for you to choose from, although, there are some kind of tried and true, and those are the ones I'll, I'll go over in a bit. Um, but nothing here, I'll just say nothing here is hard to understand how to do. Like, this is all you could read it, and you could, I get how to do it. Um, I will say user research can be difficult to do well. Um, you, you have to have a plan or goal for your research and keep that in mind as you're doing it, but you still have to be open and listen to where users take you at the same time. And there's just, there's just no way to become good at it except to just begin. You have to let yourself be bad at it, which I did. You have to let yourself be overwhelmed, which I did for a while. If you have a mentor available to you, it's really great um, to review your research plan, maybe give you suggestions. That helps a lot. If you have some design experience already, that also helps because the goal of all this research is to translate insights into products. So if you're designing, you're kind of doing some of that already. So I think um, be patient with yourself is going to be my advice. Jump in and try some things. You'll learn a lot. Um, one of, uh, I guess, another way that we can um, look at research methods is, this is Tomer Sharon. It's a little more recent. Um, and this looks, again, if you think back to our double diamond, there it is again, make the right thing, make the thing right. Um, so, um, but he has a model, Tomer Sharon's model is how to choose a research method. So you see, this is a problem, knowing what to do when. Um, so you might notice, like I said, how this intersects with the double diamond model on making the right thing, make the thing right. Once you, you read and you try some of these methods, you'll begin to get a better sense of why and when to use them. And eventually, when you get really good at it, you might even create your own methods for either collecting or sharing user research that are very custom to your situation. Um, one time I created a board game and the board game was a way to let the product team and other stakeholders play with the problem we were trying to solve and understand what we learned from user research. So there were spaces on the board that were labeled, there were spinner options, game cards, and this was all about aspects of forming a, a habit. And this helped the team understand how someone feels who wants to eat better or exercise more, that kind of thing, and what might be more or less fun for them. It helped everyone empathize with our users. It helped us share research findings. So the, the, the right way to research is any way that helps you get at some clarity, some insight for your situation. So let's dig into some methods now. And method number one is a field study. I'm not sure if you will have time for a field study, but you might, you might be able to do it depending on um, if you can get access to people easily. Um, so field studies, um, they are meant to let you observe people and the context for their life or work. You go out in the field. Um, it comes from ethnography, this idea. So this is a qualitative method, but it balances what people do and think. You're able to kind of capture both of those things. 
Um, uh, we will also talk about interviews later on um, and surveys. So let's start with field studies. So these can take different forms depending on your needs. A field study could be direct observation where you just watch people doing an activity that's in your product space, capturing interesting things they do, looking for patterns that suggest where design could help. Um, you're all maybe too young to remember, but very long time ago actually now, maybe 20 years, 20 years ago or more, <laughs> there's a famous video from um, that company IDEO we talked about earlier, um, where they reinvented shopping carts. And they just did it um, to, to do it. It was a television program where they challenged IDEO to like, well, what if you reinvented the shopping cart? So they spent a week or so and they did this. And actually you can see today the results of that video in your store. When you see a tiny cart that has little plastic carts that you put on it, like that is right in that video from 20 years ago. And all they did was send their team out, their multidisciplinary team, just like your team, and they just watched people in grocery stores and parking lots using carts. That's all they did. They found a few people to ask questions of who might be more expert who work at these places and could tell you stories about shopping carts. Um, and then they were able to redesign it. And there's another kind of field study um, called contextual inquiry, which I do more often. And this is where you conduct interviews with your users, but you do it where they work or live because you need to know how they do things in these environments in order to design useful products for them. So imagine you wanted to make products for nurses who work in hospitals or for children who are new to a school. It'd be really hard for you to do that without having them show you how they function in those environments. So um, here's a picture of me doing field study. This is a gentleman who worked at um, Comcast and this is what he does every day. Do you see all those um, remotes behind him and all these monitors? And he's, he's testing. He's got four or five screens of his own, plus all that stuff going on behind him. Um, so most products, so we're trying to fit our product into this chaos that is his life every day. JAMA Software has to be in here somewhere helping him. Um, if people use a product for work, that's a pretty strong context. And it needs to fit into a workflow for them and for others. But, you know, what is that workflow? What are they doing? Where do they do it? Who's involved? How do they get or share information they need? What's a typical day like for them? So this is the kind of field study I often do for JAMA. I learn how people who use our product do their work every day and how they work with others. It's, it's very interesting stuff. Um, but context could be important for any product. Um, when you think about it, Nobody really sits in a tidy testing laboratory reading all the instructions carefully and using the product without distraction. People make products part of their messy and complex lives. They're always kind of used in a context. You have to understand where the gaps are. Where are they struggling? What could be easier or simple, simpler for them? What motivates people? Um, so if you're making a product where the context matters a lot, and there's no other way to understand the full situation, you should probably do a field study and observe how people live or work in that context. And um, so for the diabetic, the diabetes example that I gave you earlier, um, and I did do this, this would mean visiting people who have diabetes at work and at home, walking through their day with them, having them show you how they deal with all the times they have to think about or do something about their condition. So you can take notes, you record what they tell you, you take photos of interesting things you see, you capture short videos of a process so you can remember it. You can ask them to show you how they do something. You can ask about things you notice that they don't bother to mention. So what this is what I mean, you'll learn that people can be really unreliable reporters. Um, it's common that someone, let's say, if you ask, is it easy to pump gas? They'll say, sure, it's really easy to pump gas. But if you watch them pumping gas, um, you'll see that they're fumbling with all the steps. So, so if, if, sorry. Uh, so if you think that some of the teams are gonna be a physical product, there's gonna be a consumer driven mm -hmm. uh, facing product or a mobile app mm -hmm. or IoT device, if, if they have a, some sort of pre-prototype, mm -hmm. just put it in hands of the people and mm -hmm. letting them observe how they use it will be a lot more useful than just asking questions? Well, more like if you think that your product is solving problems um, in a certain space, like let's say you were going to reinvent how people are paying for parking on the, for street parking. 
that you think people are paying for um, for bus tickets and street parking and it's all kind of confusing. So you could just stand out there and observe those people with what they're doing now. And then you would know to make your product differently. So I think what you're talking about is more like a concept test, like try my concept. I'm trying to engage with you through a concept to understand your world. You can do that. I do that a lot. It's like, well, this is not what we're making, but I'm trying to give you some concepts to make you talk about how this would work in your world or how it would not and why. I'm not asking you if you like buttons. I am asking you, like, imagine that you are a person doing X or Y and here you see this thing and here's what would happen to you. This would happen and this and this. Now talk about why this is good for you, why it's not good for you. So it is a way to elicit some information about their world, but it might be a little late in the game. So um, it kind of depends on the product you're making. If there is a context where people are doing um, the kinds of things that you would like to improve or help them with, it might be good to just watch what they're doing right now in that old environment or old context before your product comes and fills a gap in it so that you're focused on exactly what the problem is for them. Okay. Does that make sense? It does. Okay. So um, I think that um, uh, field studies are really best for setting groundwork early in your process, especially when you don't know much about your users. When you experience their lives firsthand, like, well, in addition to learning that people are not reliable reporters, they'll tell you something's easy and it's not. Um, and also there's lots of details that they don't think about anymore because it's second nature, but you will notice them and, and you're able to ask about them. But the other thing that you learn uh, by experiencing their lives firsthand is you realize you are not them. This is a very important thing to remember. It's just a common mistake to assume that people for whom you make a product think or act the same way you do. And sometimes it might be true. Like, I guess you could say, if I worked at Apple um, and I was making iPhones, like maybe the people I'm making them for are a lot like me. Um, but even, even then, if you make a product long enough, you're just eventually gonna get too close to the details. You're gonna stop seeing the product through fresh eyes, through the person who just picked it up. Um, and a field study lets you have that beginner's mind all over again. It observes your users in the natural flow of their life, and you're not thinking about products and features while you do that. You're staying open to how they think and do things right now, um, where it's good for them, where it's not good for them, that kind of thing. Does that make sense? It, it does. Okay. All right. So, um, how do you how do you do field study? Well, you got to start with a clear goal or two. You can't have too many. Um, you, you want to observe people in a certain context, so you should have a really good reason for wanting to do that. If you have too many goals, you can't state your goal in a sentence or two, you should probably rethink your plan. You want to screen participants for the qualities you want, and that saves a lot of wasted effort. I can't emphasize enough. If you talk to the wrong people, you're not going to learn anything. So you do have to have some idea who you want to talk to or why. You're not always going to get it right. Maybe you'll refine it a little bit as you go. But you want to be able to list the main characteristics in your research plan that matter for the people you'll visit. Does age matter, education, occupation, gender, um, anything about their work or family life? Why do you want to talk to those people? Have a reason. Um, uh, and make it clear as you seek your participants what you're looking for and why so that they can help screen themselves out. Figuring out where to find those people can be hard too. Um, so I've done everything to try to find people from um, kind of a friends and family recruiting approach. You just ask people, you know, do you know anybody who might be like this? Um, or a Craigslist ad, or posting through LinkedIn groups or other online forums that are, they're more likely to have the kind of people I want. Um, I once recruited at a conference aimed at the same kind of people that I wanna to talk to to see if anybody would work with me. Um, you're just going to be creative to find your users, but you wanna be safe too, okay? <laughs> so don't do anything unsafe. Um, and there are professional recruitment services for this as well, and they will use your screening criteria if you give it to them. If you already have, uh, so I'm lucky right now, I already have customers. I'm at a company, we have customers, and so I just have to have a way to reach out to them and screen them for what I want, and that's mostly how I get research participants now. Um, so then to recruit people, you're going to um, set up a schedule for your visits. Now this part's harder than it sounds for a field study, just the coordination of it all. 
I've heard estimates that say even getting eight people who are right for your research and can meet with you soon may take as much as 40 hours of your time. So don't underestimate how difficult this can be. Um, there are tools now that help a lot, like Calendly. I don't know if you're aware of that tool. I think it's mm -hmm. pretty common. But you just open up what slots are available and people pick the slot they want. And then that goes on your um, calendar. You have a meeting then. So that's really a, a very handy way to, to schedule people. Um, and a lot of people ask, well, how many should you recruit? How many is enough? Um, well, that's hard to say. Um, I would say for a field study. So for any qual, um, excuse me, I need a little water here. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> for any qualitative work like this, you need fewer people. You're getting very rich information. It's a very deep engagement you're having with a single person. You don't need as many. Um, I would say for the same type of user, if you're saying, um, I want to talk to uh, this type of person who's this old, who does this kind of work, <clears throat> four to six of the same type of user is usually plenty. I think when you start seeing similarities in what you observe, you know you're okay. So three is a little thin in case there's an anomaly, someone who just is like, they, they just don't match, but you can't tell, like, are they the anomaly, or are they not? Four is a little safer. Four to six is pretty safe, but it's a lot of data that you're going to get even by engaging with four to six people in this way. Um, but again, when you start hearing the same kinds of stories, you know you're in a good place. Um, and you want to let people know as part of your recruitment message, this is important, how you're going to use this information. So I would say in my, in my career, I've always fought to keep people's information confidential. I've always insisted that it be kept confidential and that I explain to them I'm only going to use it to make a better product. No one's going to see this information. Um, and that way they share more freely. You may need to sign, if you go into someone's workplace, you might need to sign non-disclosure agreements to work with some of the people there because they need to protect their intellectual property you should maybe offer a recording consent form for participants to sign, like this firms up that you're guaranteeing how you're gonna use their information. I find it's often good, especially for a field study, which is a, a big ask from somebody, you're gonna spend a lot of time with them, to offer a small thank you, like a gift card, to thank them for their time. Okay, and we have a question, let's see. Who is asking questions? Is it, oh, I don't know. Let me see. Somebody raise their hand, maybe. Oh, oh right. Okay, Siri. Um, go ahead. We'll mute you, Mike. What is your question? One of the things that uh, I wanted to know was, do you typically record the sessions when you're connecting with participants for field studies? And how have that gone in the past when you have recorded the sessions? Okay. Um, I do talk about that in a little bit, but let me just give you an advance, um, advance, a sneak peek at that content that's coming up. We do record, record, record. You must capture. There is no point in going and doing these things if you don't capture it. You cannot trust your own biases and your own memory to give you an accurate um, recounting of what happened. Record it. You might not use it all, um, but you'll have it. Uh, I have developed over time certain preferences. I don't like video, for instance, as much as I did initially, mostly because it, well, and I'll explain that in a bit, but video just is a, it takes a lot more time for the amount of value you get back from it. Um, uh, but I'll, I'll talk about this more in just a minute, if that's okay. I think it's good, yeah. Okay. Oh. Somebody else raising their question. We have here. Is there another question? No, some comments on the chat. Um, okay. Okay. She's All right. Perfect. All right. So I'll I'll give you a little more detail on this in just a minute. Okay. All right. So the next thing you're going to do is make a, a field study guide. You're going to structure your visit, make an agenda for the day. Um, you want, again, your guide your, for your field study to reflect the goals you set. Don't forget about those. You set goals. Your guide should be carrying them forward. 
Think about how you want to work with someone once you're there. What do you want them to focus on to help you meet that research goal? What should they show you? What should they do? And we'll talk about asking good questions in the interview research method um, next. But for a field study, questions should be really open and exploratory, like walk me through how you do that. What do you do first? Why? What next? Please show me that. Who else does this? things like that. You're letting their environment be a way to jog their memory and you're letting details you see be a way to prompt through um, a situation. Um, you'll ask them to expand on details you observe that they don't think are important, like I saw you refer to a list you have on your desk. What is that list? So like I said, they use it every day, they don't think about it, but there's something important in it potentially. Mm -hmm. um, never ask leading questions in user research. Leading questions are often questions that someone would answer with yes or no. Like, do you hate this mess? Or would you like to get more sleep? Um, so you're telling them what to think or feel, and that's not helpful in research. For a field study, you're going to want to have um, possible questions um, ready for each topic or area that you want to explore um, and see what happens when you ask them. Mostly you want to prompt them to show you how to do something or ask them to tell you about uh, more about details that cut your interest or you don't fully understand. And here's your question about recording. Be ready for anything. Bring help. Um, it's very hard to do a field study by yourself. Um, and you want to capture what happens. But here's the catch. You don't want to be annoying with your recording choices. You need to make this as low key as you can for them. It's just strange enough to have you there. So you want to set people at ease. You want to make it comfortable for them. And, and by be ready, I mean have power backups or storage backups. Keep your cameras or audio recorders working and ready. Um, sound can be hard to capture well in settings like this. So you're going to want to practice with your recording devices in advance. Um, and as I said, I've come to prefer audio and photos over video. I use video very selectively to maybe capture a process that's hard to understand. And this is mostly because it takes a long time to edit video. Also, it's more disruptive to the participants to have a camera pointed at them all the time. That creates a distance and a strangeness that it just isn't worth it a lot of the time. Once though, I mean, maybe you're clever, more clever than I've been, and you could find a way to make it work. I, one time I did do this and it was pretty effective. I created a shoulder strap rig for a GoPro camera and so the camera was sort of stuck with a Velcro thing just on the person's shoulder. Um, and it worked pretty well because I think the person that we were working with, the people in that study, they just quickly ignored it. It was so tiny, it was just stuck on his shoulder right here. And he was talking and working with you normally and so was I and that camera was just picking things up. So it wasn't the best video and we had some audio problems, but it was really unobtrusive. So there may be ways to include video. It's very good, as I said, to have someone with you to help capture what you see and hear or take notes. You're going to want to be real clear about people's roles and who's doing what, because if you walk away and find out, oh, I thought you were going to do that, that's, then you missed it. That's it. Um, so depending on what kind of visit this is, having someone with you is safer too. But if you bring more than two people, again, being unobtrusive, like that's kind of awkward. It's hard for your participant to relax and share openly when they're so outnumbered like that. Um, and any notes you take. So when I say capture, I mean capture. Um, any notes you take should simply describe what is said or what happens. Do not try to analyze what anything means during a research session. Never do that. You're just absorbing it, capturing it, being in the moment, um, going where they take you, okay? So let's go on to method two. I would say field studies are, um, they're very rich. They're maybe difficult. They're more time consuming potentially if you actually are doing the kind of contextual inquiry I said, or if you're just gonna stand and observe people doing shopping carts, maybe you could do it real fast. So it just all depends. Um, a really good method interviews, if you do them well, they can reveal a lot of information with far less effort than a field study. It might be better fit for what you guys are facing or where everybody's facing um, in the time span for this. Yes. So um, you're gonna, you can use them when the person's context doesn't really matter or, or like we're saying time is kind of too short. 
Um, again, it's really the same. You're going to make a research plan. You need a plan that helps everyone understand why you're doing this research and what you hope to get from the interviews. Um, it's much like a field study. It's just easier because you're asking less of your participants. I would say the great thing about interviews is that they usually do not have to be in person. They can be, but they usually don't have to be. So you can easily fit them into your schedule. Plus, you can invite more people on the team to listen to the interview. And that helps everybody learn more about the user. And especially if it's remote, the user themselves, I think, quickly forgets that there might be five other people listening. Um, I would try not to exceed 60 minutes for interviews. Um, people do tend to start saying no to you when they get longer like that. Um, I'd be sure and record them and again, get the user's permission to do that. Never schedule your interviews back to back. Um, leave time between interviews. I find that it's really valuable after you have an interview, whoever had participated in it or listened to it, have a little time to discuss it right afterwards and um, time to reset for the next one. So do not schedule interviews back to back. It's a big mistake. I would say too, if you're, if you're doing interviews really well, I don't know how many of you listen to Terry Gross on the radio doing an interview. She's, a, she's really uh, the master of doing interviews. She's on public radio. Um, if you listen to how she does interviews, what I'm gonna say here makes sense. It is really hard to do more than four, I would say, you could maybe do five um, interviews in a single day. They require intense concentration on what is being said. They will make you tired. If you do them right, you should be really tired after four interviews in a day. So don't overschedule yourself. And as before, you, you, know, you do need to let people know you're recording the sessions, but you're only going to use them to make a better product. Assure them that you're going to keep what they share confidential so they will speak more openly. There are many tools out there for recording audio and transcribing it for you. Um, some of you probably use some of these already. The transcriptions usually aren't perfect. Like I think the thing we're using right now does this. Zoom we're using right now. Um, so I have been using Zoom lately for this. That's a te this teleconference tool. It will record and transcribe. I found another tool that I was testing. It's just audio transcription. You record and then you um, upload your audio to it. It's called Trint, T-R-I-N-T. Um, but honestly, old school is not too bad. If you have a fast typist on your team, someone who types real fast, consider having them simply type a rough transcript as they go. So what they're doing is they're at the, they're at the computer and they're just capturing as much of what people are actually saying as they can. It doesn't have to be perfect. But it is important in user research like this in interviews to capture what happened, what they said, what they showed you. Again, don't process or analyze it as it's happening, just capture it. Okay, how does a good interview go? Um, well, first you're gonna write an interview guide. Here's just a, a bit of one that I wrote once. Um, you wanna organize the topics um, and make sure this is all meeting your goals. You wanna test it and make sure that it makes sense. So, um, for instance, in this one, I have a few background questions. I have um, some getting and sharing information and I have times on it. So make sure it's organized, it's, it's written to your goals and make sure when you test it, um, if for time and clarity, it, it's, it comes up a winner. Um, what's the first thing you wanna do in an interview? Start with something easy, something to help you learn a little bit about their background, something to warm them up. Over the years, I've discovered that the first part of an interview is almost a throwaway. It's just you and them getting to know each other a little, feeling comfortable in a conversation. So at first, they're going to be a little more distant, a little more clipped, a little more, um, I guess, a little cold, you need to warm them up, make them feel comfortable. So give them something easy to talk about at first. Um, things like, what is your role at this company? How long have you been in this role? Um, what's a typical week like for you? Um, or you can ask them lifestyle questions related to your product or idea. How do you ask good questions in an interview? There's, um, some of you are probably aware of um, the journalism five W's and an H. Now what it means for journalism is if I have an article that I'm publishing and it can answer all of 
these questions, who, where, what, why, when, and how, I have a good article. That's good journalism. But these, these words, you should see them in your interview guide, you should see them at the beginning of questions that you're asking. These mean that you're asking good open-ended questions. Um, you want to work on getting any leading or yes or no questions out of your interviews. Another way to ask good questions, scenarios. So these are some possible phrases you can use, but you're actually just trying to invite people to share their past history or typical behavior in certain situations. It's a good way to have them open up and have a conversation with you and get at a little bit more of the behavioral stuff versus the attitudinal stuff, um, what they've done versus what they think. Um, people actually really enjoy having others interested in their lives and work. And I think questions like this encourage longer responses too. So there are more chances for your participant to say something compelling or curious that can lead to insight for you. So um, if they say something uh, kind of short and um, not informative, maybe you can say, well, talk some more about that um, and see if there's more behind it. Uh, if they say something you don't quite understand, you can ask them to help you understand it. I don't, I think you have to be unafraid to, to um, appear as if you don't know everything in an interview. Um, take a genuine interest. Another way to ask good questions, even if it's not on your interview guide, learn to have these in your side pocket, prompts. Um, so you'll ask the question, they'll say something. And um, often I think people need a little prodding to know that you find what they say interesting and you actually would be okay if they would say more about it. Or maybe again, like it's so second nature to them, they don't know that there's any, anything interesting here. So they might start out giving shorter or less detailed answers that you really don't understand. And, and like I said, just don't be afraid to let them know you may have misunderstood or you'd like to hear more about something that they share with you. I think prompting for more detail is a really good interviewing habit. Again, I'd say go listen to Terry Grove. She does this constantly. Um, give yourself permission to say, I'm not sure I understand. Please tell me more about that. Um, so add prompts as you go to any answers that feel incomplete somehow or leave you wondering. You can also think about prompts as a way to get to the core issue or essential value in something they share. Um, this is a technique called laddering, um, L-A-D-D-E-R, like a ladder, laddering. For example, if someone um, says they would prefer to exercise with someone else, maybe you ask them a question about exercising and why don't, why don't they do it? Um, well, they'd prefer to exercise with someone else. And you ask, well, why do you want, what would you get out of exercising with someone else? Why do you want that? And they say, well, it's, it's more fun. And you say, well, how is it more fun? And they say, because someone is there to encourage me and in case anything happens. And then you ask, well, what might happen? And then they admit, and this is, this is a real thing that happened in an interview that I did, they admit they sometimes have low, low blood sugar incidents when they exercise and they're really nervous about exercising a lot. So they're scared. They said something kind of, they threw something out, out there, but actually they're afraid to go out and exercise by themselves. Now, this is now a very different conversation and you have an insight about something this person truly needs. Okay? And then at the end of the interview, um, you want to make sure you're letting them know you're wrapping up. You're getting near the end. You're giving them a chance to ask any last thoughts, ask a question. You can let them know if they think of something later. They can email it to you if they remember something they meant to tell you um, but forgot. And sometimes this is a good time to ask if they'd be interested in participating in any future research or usability testing on the products too. Um, so many people find the process entertaining and they, uh, they really like participating. It's interesting. Okay. We have um, one last method here. I know we're getting short of time, though. Did you want to skip ahead and go past surveys? Um, let's talk real quick about surveys and analyzing data and resources. Um, OK. Yeah, so we have time. You have time? All right. Yeah. So, um, so writing the survey. Um, well, surveys, let me just go back one, surveys. Um, so if you find your team is arguing a finer point about an idea, you're stuck between two choices, 
you could consider a survey. Um, so in my work, sometimes we can't answer a simple question about what the users value most or want to know. Um, uh, we might wonder what users prefer among various design choices, things like that, where mm -hmm. a lot is known, but there's a quibble or a disagreement or a piece of missing information. Um, maybe we see usage data that makes us wonder why people are using some features but not others. Well, we could ask them. Um, so when you need just a little bit more data to drive a decision, consider a survey. They're not really good for lengthy or complex research needs, but I think most people will not mind answering a few questions about something that interests them. Okay, so when you write it, again, always in research, you need a clear goal. You need to design your research around that goal. You want to keep them short. Um, it's, it's important, I think, I, I find that people often just won't finish surveys if they're too long, so you want to keep them short. Um, you want to write them simply and clearly, no jargon, again, no leading questions. You want their honest opinion. Um, to ensure that more people finish your survey, don't make them write in answers, but have them choose among likely responses. You might allow some other, like other as a choice, as a write-in response where possible, but don't, don't do too much of that, just where it, it might be valuable. It's a really good idea to test your survey with other people to make sure it makes sense. If your question is badly written and hard to understand exactly, like you're just gonna end up getting data you can't trust. So I hope that makes sense. Um, you should design surveys, again, keep them short. Design for time, how quickly could someone do this? Not number of questions. Then if you're going to launch the survey, choose a tool to do that with. Um, there are just a lot of good online survey tools out there. Uh, many have free versions. There's SurveyMonkey, there's WooFoo, there's Typeform, you even have Google Forms. Um, choose something that's easy for your intended audience to use. I've even seen simple questions in a Slack channel with a list of heart emojis in different colors that people can tap on to vote. So that's like a good quick survey if your users are already in a Slack channel with you, let's say. Um, uh, you're gonna wanna find your audience and make sure that you're screening for the people you wanna talk to. Um, so ask them a few questions about themselves first. Um, you can do that, the survey tool might let you do that and then it'll end the survey if they're not eligible. If not, you can ask them in the survey to just give them a little sense of who they are. That way you can balance like, is this person's answer valuable? It's not really who we're aiming at. Okay, and of course you like decide how long you're gonna run it, how many responses you'd like to see, those kinds of things. Okay, now you have a bunch of information. What are you gonna do with it? Well, to make sense of information from research, the, the short answer is you have to look for a pattern in it. That's what you're trying to do. I think with surveys, um, it's a little easier. They let you export it to a spreadsheet. It's data you can sort or filter. Um, it's just a little easier to analyze a survey for patterns. Um, but for the other things, for field studies or interviews, it really helps to have rough transcripts of any audio recordings from field studies and interview. Those transcripts are, are kind of um, gold because you will be able to pull key quotes from a spreadsheet um, into a spreadsheet. So that's what you see here. It's a little bit of a really big spreadsheet I made once upon a time. You put the key quote in there. Um, you can even pile these in a simple document um, and you'll give each of the quotes a clear meaning. It'll be a need or a pain point or you'll just sort them by the ones that are similar. You know, these are like those, I have about five buckets of things potentially. Whatever you can do to figure out what is the same, where is the pattern. Um, then you can roll up the needs and pain points into a larger theme. That, and, and I like to state those themes with clear user-oriented headlines. So the, this is just a sample of some data, but the theme for the data you see on this screen, for instance, ended up being Help me find it easily so I can stay focused on tasks. Um, and the pattern you find means there's some behavior or need that is the same across the participants in your research. And once you have that larger theme actually, so this is where it all becomes, this is the translational part 
once you're able to find that those themes from these little these little atoms roll up into molecules become some kind of substantial thing a theme then you can imagine pro product opportunities that would actually please and help your users that's the point where it all becomes very much more clear and you've gone from your convergent thinking to di divergent thinking you're defining the problems very clearly um, so, for example, in the thing you're looking at right now, findability is clearly a larger theme, and that opens up a lot of opportunities to improve search, give people better ways to organize information, give them more personalization so that the product remembers what they have been looking at recently and makes it easy to find. Lots of things become clear and possible to you um, at that point. You have, you have things that will be successful to choose from and you feel confident. Um, another part of, an important part of user research is how you will communicate the results. So not just finding the patterns and the themes, you have to be able to communicate them. Um, you should present your findings and recommendations to the team in some way. Um, what opportunities should this team consider for the product as they choose a well-defined problem they want to solve? Why? include quotes and images from your research to bring it alive or create audio or video highlight reels to illustrate your themes so you're trying to boil it all down communicate it make it powerful have them see what you what you're seeing and, and as i said surveys are much easier to do this with unless you have a lot of written responses that you need to read and analyze but even with surveys you should present findings and recommendations for the product based on those responses um, one thing you can do with this very same information is to take those themes that you've discovered and create user personas. And this is an important design artifact, an important outcome of research. Um, they're created from user research, just like the field study and interview research. Like you can, I always, with that kind of research, I end up either creating or informing existing personas with the very same research. Because um, I've learned a lot about users and what they're doing in a new context. Um, you should not have too many user personas. These do represent the main audiences for your product, not every single person who might ever encounter your product, but the main audiences for your product. Each should have a distinctive behavior or attitudes that are drawn from actual details you discovered about your users. So what behavior patterns matter most for your product? You want to turn that pattern into a person with a face and a name and a story. You want to help your team understand what motivates the persona and how they act in key situations. It's really good to focus on a main persona in making a product choice. Though when you design for a main persona, I find you often serve other personas to some extent. Um, and as you pursue other product opportunities, like I said, you have a chance to learn more about your personas and bring fresh understanding to them in different contexts. Um, and they may change over time. You may move away from some of them and introduce others as your product changes. Um, so why personas? Why do this? It's just easier to design well for a few familiar people than imagine what almost anyone may possibly want or need. You will find that product teams often refer to the user, the user, and make this imaginary user who is very elastic and changeable. And they that elastic user seems to care about all kinds of edge cases. But that user, that kind of user, that does not actually exist. Um, if you make a product for a user like that, you're going to make a cluttered product with too many features that bring no value to your actual users. It's better to design for a main kind of user and then you can design more deeply and well, you'll make a better product. Um, user personas are how you prevent the elastic user and you're able to have people understand this together and you're able to together then say no to products or features that your persona would not want or use. Um, if teams make more decisions based on serving a user persona, they will create more deeply valuable products. Um, and if you can't do that, so you guys are on a tight timeline, you don't have time to collect enough research so that you feel like you know deeply and well who the users are you can imagine them. So what you see on the screen here is called um, an empathy map. It was created by Dave Gray at X-Plane. He's got a great book called Game Storming, and this is one of the exercises in it. Um, so 
if you can't learn about your users firsthand, at least get the team to stop and imagine them in the situation or context for your product. Who are they? What's going on? What are they trying to do? What do they see, hear, or say? What do they do in this situation? And as you look um, at everything on your empathy map for this person and their situation, where do they struggle and what do they desire? So you can build a kind of a, a profile that you can use and coalesce around, um, even if you aren't able to get all of the user research you need to make personas. So um, as you can see, I think uh, user research is a really big topic but it's really fascinating. So I think it's time well spent in making a, that will truly make a product better. I just recommend jumping in and trying some of these methods I presented or um, try others that I didn't present. And I put a little sheet of resources here at the end. These are good books and places that you can go to get more help. Some are um, good classics on user research. Some are just collections of methods so you can go through all those hundreds of methods I mentioned and see what you find that will work for you. Um, there's a thing called lean research and lean UX. This is like, if you can't really get it into your work very formally, these might be lighter weight ways to try. And then I just, that uh, rocket surgery made easy book by Steve Krug is a really good guide about usability testing. So that's it. All right. <laughs> Thank you so much, Eva. I'm gonna unmute everybody just to give an opportunity to uh, everybody to have an opportunity to to share or ask questions. Mm -hmm. uh, we learn a great deal um, information, and let me do a quick uh, rundown to with my notes over here just to make sure that I capture the everything. So. User research takes time. Yeah. Uh, it could be qualitative and quantitative, depending how much time mm -hmm. you, you, you have. Or what you're trying to understand. Absolutely. Uh, user research make you to do the right thing to make the thing right. Yeah. If you do the user research right up front, you will build the right product. Yeah. Uh, or get you as close as possible mm -hmm. to the next iteration of your product. Uh, field studies, get out of the room, right? Get it, out of the room, yeah. Very important. Your users don't live in there, and they're not you. Yes, absolutely. Uh, make a research plan. Uh, doesn't have to be too complex, but have a plan when you go out there. What what you try to accomplish? What kind of information you want to extract? Right. Uh, observe people. Right. Uh, be transparent with uh, with the people you're interviewing. Let them know how you're gonna use your research. Um, bring help. Uh, somebody to, to help you out or take notes mm -hmm. or a recording device that will help you capture some information and leave your bias out of the door. Uh, asking good questions, I think that was very important. Yeah. Uh, the who, the where, the why, what and when, uh, of course the how. Mm -hmm. uh, keep your surveys short. Sometimes we want to make long surveys, mm -hmm. but it's not about the quantity of the questions, it's about the time. Yeah, People if they can will... do it in two minutes, they'll probably do it yeah. for a minute, yeah. So, and look for the pattern. I think that was huge for me. Uh, mm -hmm. What are the patterns you see after you're done with the interview? Mm -hmm. And if you don't your job right with user research, as you mentioned at the end, you can use that research to create a user persona that will create a value proposition. That's right. It's in short for the, what are we doing for Jim? What are we doing for Sally? You know, instead of having to always uh, figure out, well, the user wants, the user wants, and then you have these strange fights with, that don't get you anywhere or make your product into a Frankenstein product, which you don't want. Absolutely. So. With that said, let's open up for questions. If any of you have any questions, uh, I know we got a little bit over time. It's our first webinar of the year. We'll adjust in time for the next one, but real quick, uh, any questions you guys might have uh, before we end the webinar? I'm good, I have to go. I just wanna say thank you very much. That was a great lecture, thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank I hope you. it helps. Appreciate it. Take care. Okay. Anybody else? If not, okay. So, uh, so our next webinar will be February fifth, and it's gonna be with uh, Kevin Stayworld uh, from JAMA. He's the VP of Product and User Experience, and we're gonna talk about product development uh, and process. So, with that said, uh, we are done for the day. And uh, look forward to talking talking to you. And once again, Eva, thank you so much for.
joining us today. Oh, thank you for inviting me. I had a good time. Thank you. Bye.